In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, how does a variable frequency drive work? Just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of motor controls in association with Crompton controls. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. In previous videos, we looked at systems that controlled the stopping and starting of motors in the form of direct online and star delta starters. These devices are used to turn motors on and off, but don't allow for controlling the speed of the motors. For that, we need a slightly more complex piece of equipment. For a long time during the early years of electric motors, it was very difficult to control the speed of an AC motor and quite easy to control DC motors. All you had to do with a DC motor was whack some massive resistors in series with the motor and change which ones were connected to vary the speed. Not very efficient, but very effective. But AC motors were different. How so? Well, to understand how to control the speed of an AC motor, you need to understand how an AC motor works. A motor has three coils of wire wound up inside it, and these are offset from each other by 120 degrees. Here you can see a model of what the three coils look like. And these ends would normally be wired up the sides to an access box for terminating. For the purposes of this video, we'll just leave them loose here. Now, although these are connected to an AC supply, it's helpful to know which end of the winding is which to start with. Depending on where you are in the world, the markings on these conductors will be a little different, but here we're going to go with U, V, and W. And we'll differentiate the two ends of each winding with numbers. So this one here is U1, and the other end is U2. This end will be V1. Notice that the end is offset by 120 degrees from U1, and the other end, V2, is offset by 120 degrees from U2. And the same principle applies to the final winding with W1 here and W2 here. Now, if we look at a three-phase waveform, you can see that there's three sine waves, and again, they're offset from each other by 120 degrees. So that means the voltage, and therefore the current they drive, is peaking and dropping at different moments in time. Now, at this point, there's one really important thing to remember about an AC waveform, and that is that as the current drops into this negative part of the graph, it indicates that the current has changed direction and is going the other way around the circuit. That's going to be critically important in just a moment. So we're going to say that when the current is in the positive part of the cycle, it's going into the terminal marked with a 1 and coming out of the terminal marked with a 2. And when the current goes into the negative part of the cycle, it's changed direction and goes the other way. For simplicity, we'll connect the motor in star, which means we'll connect all the wires marked 2 together and connect U1 to line 1, V1 to line 2, and W1 to line 3. So now we've got the motor connected, we'll take another look at our sine wave, but we'll freeze it at a moment in time. So here you can see the current flowing through line 1 is at maximum in the positive part of the graph, and so is going into U1 and round the coil this way. The current in line 2 is halfway from its peak in the negative part of the cycle, and so is going the opposite way, into V2 and round this way. And line 3 is behaving exactly the same way. So now we know the direction of the current in each coil, if we take a cross section of the motor, we can represent the current flowing in each group of conductors. Here, the current is going away from us, and so we represent that with a cross, and here it's flowing towards us, which we represent with a dot. In the winding marked V, we can see that the current flows towards us here and away from us here. And so we place the dot and cross accordingly, and in W, we have a similar situation. Now, when current flows through a conductor, it generates a magnetic field around it. If current is flowing away from you, the magnetic field has a clockwise direction, and if it's flowing towards you, the field has an anti-clockwise direction. So we can show all the fields around the conductors, and it will look a bit like this. However, these magnetic fields will obey the laws of physics and meld into each other on each side while repelling each other down the middle. So we end up with a magnetic field that looks like this. Now, we know that the current never stands still in an AC circuit, but is ever-changing. And so if we consider another point on the waveform, we can see that things have changed. L1 is now still positive, but of a smaller magnitude. L3 is at its maximum negative value, but the real change is that the L2 has now become positive. In other words, it's changed its direction. So how does this affect the current into the motor? Well, if we swap the direction of current in our V winding, it will also change the polarity of the magnetic field around that conductor, making the whole magnetic field look like this. So you can see that the whole magnetic field has shifted around by 60 degrees, and we can keep on repeating this process. If we look at a third moment in time on our three-phase waveform, we can see that the L2 current is now peaking at a maximum positive value, 
and the L1 current has gone negative and therefore changed direction. So now our cross section has the opposite current flow in L1 and it makes the whole magnetic field look like this. Again, it's shifted round by 60 degrees. And actually, if we keep on doing this process, we end up with a magnetic field that looks something like this. We've developed a rotating magnetic field inside the motor. This rotating magnetic field is what causes the mechanically moving part of the motor to rotate. And because the magnetic field, and therefore the motor, is rotating due to the rising, falling, and reversing nature of the three-phase AC supply, the frequency of the waveform, in other words, how many times the waveform completes one full cycle per second, will define the speed of the motor. Now, here in the UK, the frequency of the electricity network is fixed at 50 hertz and will only vary very slightly from that, which means that in theory, all our motors will run at the same speed. There will be some differences based on the structure and nature of the motor, but the principle is clear. Frequency defines speed in an AC motor. So to adjust the speed, we need to adjust the frequency of the supply we connect it to. We do that by means of a variable frequency drive or VFD. Now, these work in what seems like quite a counterintuitive way because the first thing that a variable frequency drive does is to take the three-phase AC power supply and convert it to DC using a device called a rectifier. The reason why it does this will become clear as we get further into the process of how a VFD works. A three-phase rectifier consists of six diodes connected together in a specific way. These diodes are like one-way valves for electricity and therefore only allow current to pass through them one way. As the three-phase supply passes through the diodes, it will change the waveform so that it looks like this, which is a pretty wobbly DC waveform. Now, one really clever thing about changing the supply to DC is that it means we can also use similar principles to convert a single-phase AC supply to DC as well. This only requires the use of four diodes arranged in a slightly different way, but from this point on, everything that happens to the DC current will work as well for a single-phase source as it does for a three-phase source. So, as we'll see, what that means is that we can use the principles of a variable frequency drive to create a three-phase supply from a single-phase supply. Clever stuff. This wobbly DC waveform then moves on to the next stage of the internal circuitry of the VFD, which is called a DC bus. All this part does is take that wobbly waveform and smooth it out using capacitors. These charge up with a bit of current while the current is rising, and then as it drops away, it releases that current back into the circuit, meaning that the waveform starts to look smoother. Now we've got a nice smooth DC supply, we move on to the really clever part of the VFD. This part is called the inverter, and it takes the DC supply and turns it into, wait for it, a three-phase supply. It seems like a lot of effort to get back to where we started, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. The inverter is a very complicated piece of circuitry, but at its heart are six devices referred to as insulated gate bipolar transistors, or IGBTs. There's a few different ways that we can use transistors, but to keep it simple, they're basically just like little switches that can control the direction that current flows in. These IGBTs are finely controlled by further electronics to switch on and off in a sequence that starts to output something that looks like a three-phase waveform, but with incredibly poor resolution. The current is basically on in one direction, off or on in the other direction. However, because we can control the way these IGBTs switch on and off so incredibly finely, we can use something referred to as pulse width modulation. So instead of just being on in one direction and letting all the current flow, they actually flick on and off incredibly quickly for different but very short periods of time. Or we can say they are pulsing on and off. In other words, they are changing or modulating the width of the pulse. These different pulses of current have different average values because of the time they're on for, which means that by looking at those average values, the output waveform of the electricity starts to look increasingly like the nice, smooth AC waveform that we're used to. And so finally, the mystery is solved. By varying the timing that the tiny switches are turning on and off at, we can start to change the frequency of the output waveform. And remember, in the first part of the video, we said the speed at which the magnetic field in the motor turns depends on the frequency of the three-phase supply. So by varying the frequency of the output from the drive, we can control the speed of the motor. So this is brilliant for applications where you might want to change the speed at which a machine runs, maybe on a conveyor belt, an assembly line, or pumping and ventilation equipment. And not only does that control help to fine tune the motor speeds, it can also make your equipment run more efficiently. It's very, very clever stuff. 
And that concludes this series of videos. If you found it helpful, why not click the link in the description below to complete our free training package on this subject to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this series is to say, thank you very much for watching.